Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Carrie Grady Vincent, and I am the Senior Manager of Scientific and Clinical Programs at Osteoporosis Canada. I will be your moderator for today's webinar, Osteoporosis and Osteoarthritis, What You Need to Know, brought to you by Osteoporosis Canada and Arthritis Society Canada. But before we begin, Osteoporosis Canada acknowledges the land that our offices located in Toronto are on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Osteoporosis Canada is the only national organization serving people who have or are at risk for osteoporosis. The organization works to educate, empower, and support individuals and communities in the risk reduction and treatment of osteoporosis. At Osteoporosis Canada, we educate Canadians about bone, den bone health, including healthcare professionals and their clients. We are very excited about today's presentation. We will be providing general information about osteoporosis and osteoarthritis. It is not our intention to provide individual advice. Before starting any new activity, we suggest talking to your family physician. <clears throat> our presentation today will take a question and answer format. If you have further questions during the webinar, please remember to click the question and answer button on your screen to submit your questions and we will try to get to as many as we can, time dependent. So without further ado, let's get started. It is my privilege and honor to introduce our two speakers today. Dr. Heather McDonald Bloomer is a rheumatologist at Mount Sinai Hospital and University Health Network. Her clinical interests include osteoporosis and inflammatory joint disease. Dr. McDonald Bloomer has been an active member of the rheumatology community locally and nationally, and is known as a passionate teacher and educator. Dr. McDonald Bloomer is also an active member of our Scientific Advisory Council. Lisa Robinson is a registered physiotherapist and has been with Arthritis Society Canada for 11 years. She provides care to her patients as a primary therapist in the Kingston and Belleville region. Lisa works with the local rheumatologists to provide initial assessments and follow up care for their patients. And now I will turn it over to our speakers, Heather and Lisa. Thanks, Carrie, for the lovely introduction. Um, and it's such a joy to be able to reach out to so many people and to work with Lisa, who I've only had the opportunity to meet uh, in a virtual capacity, but it, it's a, a good one. So now in terms of things, um, I think we have some questions to, to start us off. Is that correct? Yes, um, if we can get our first slide. Our first question is, what is the difference between osteoporosis and osteoarthritis? Okay, and I think I'm up first. So maybe if we go, could go to the next slide, it's a bit of a, a cartoon or a, a demonstration. But if we look, there is a formal definition for osteoporosis and it's known as a skeletal disease. So something that affects the bone which with time changes the quantity and the quality of bone, and that leads to an increased risk of fracture. So if you look on the left-hand side, you can see this kind of honeycomb looking shape um, where there are nice thick pieces of bone. They're all really nicely interconnected. And that represents normal bone, both quantity and quality. And that bone is moderately fracture resistant. I say moderately because everybody can break a bone, but for the most part, um, that's our fracture resistant bone. Whereas if we look on the right side, you'll see that the actual pieces of bone are much thinner. Um, there are bigger gaps in between and that if we could actually look even deeper into that, the structure of the bone has actually changed. So this is showing us that with a variety of different processes, age being the number one, we lose bone um, quantity and we lose bone quality. And that's why a slip and fall activity can lead to a fracture. So that's really what osteoporosis looks like. 
Um, I think the big piece to remember is all of this happens without us really knowing. Um, so we don't get pain related to this initial process. Uh, we'll talk about that later, but it's really known as a silent process, similar to high blood pressure. We don't know that you've got high blood pressure unless there are consequences. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa, who's gonna give us a little bit of a summary in terms of what osteoarthritis is. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so that's osteoporosis, uh, which is often confused with osteoarthritis because their names sound so similar. Um, there's actually a lot of different types of arthritis, but osteoarthritis is the most common one. It affects about one in six people, which is about 5 million Canadians. So there, there's a lot of people out there who have osteoarthritis. It is a degenerative condition that affects the cartilage. And the cartilage is this tough, slippery tissue that coats the ends of our bones uh, in our joints. And what happens in osteoarthritis is that that cartilage, it is deteriorating or it's breaking down faster than the body is able to effectively repair it. Um, as part of that repair process, what can often happen is that the body might end up laying down extra little bits of bone around the edges of the bone, uh, which are called osteophytes. So as that cartilage uh, deteriorates, you end up having not as much space in between those bones within that joint. And that can mean that you have less range of motion available. You might have more stiffness. You might experience pain or a sensation of a loss of confidence in the joint as though if you take the wrong step or a certain movement that that joint might give way on you. Um, those are all things that you can experience. So there's lots of symptoms with the osteoarthritis. And the x-rays can show all of those types of things. It can show the loss of joint space because there would be less black space in between the bones. Uh, it can show those little bony spurs, which tend to be more easily visible in that, like a superficial joint like your hand, uh, where people sometimes they have those enlarged knuckles. But that same process can be happening throughout our body at our, our hips and our knees and our spine. We also know that the, the severity of the degeneration doesn't always match well with the symptoms that the person experiences. Uh, so often people can experience um, quite significant pain, quite significant functional loss, even though the x-rays might only show mild to moderate osteoarthritis. Uh, but then on the flip side, sometimes people will have quite severe arthritis as seen on imaging, but in reality, they aren't experiencing severe effects from it. They don't have too much pain and they're still quite mobile. Um, so you can have both osteoporosis and osteoarthritis, but one does not cause the other. In one, you're really losing bone density, as you just heard about, and then the other, you're really losing cartilage. And then that repair process kind of gone wrong where you can end up with this extra bone and these other features around it and quite a few symptoms that go along with it. Whereas the osteoporosis tends to be fairly asymptomatic as Dr. McDonald Bloomer said. So that's the difference in between those two. Lisa, that's a lovely explanation. And I think that, you know, the piece that we'll probably talk about a little bit more is osteo just really means bone. And so when people come in and say, oh, I'm here for my osteo, I always have sort of a quizzical look on my face because it could be osteoporosis, it could be osteoputrosis, it could be, you know, osteoarthritis. So I think using the full term is actually a really helpful issue. And unfortunately, both of them are kind of age related to some extent. So um, anybody who walks in the door, your office or mine, who's 50 and over, we're probably thinking about those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder, can we go on to the second question then? That might be a good segue. Sure, yeah. Our second question is, how is each condition diagnosed? Okay, and I think my slide is up next, so if we go to that. So as we've said, because osteoporosis is mostly silent, then it becomes really important to have a dialogue with your healthcare provider. And there are really three ways I think we make a diagnosis of osteoporosis, but they all really start with a conversation looking for risk factors. And there are a lot of things that we know are very specifically related, age being number one. So, you know, if a 30 year old um, comes into my office, I have a different mindset than if somebody who's 75 comes in because we know that people over the age of 50 start to lose bone. We know that women tend to lose bone at a faster rate than men. And so that becomes an issue. And so just in terms of the age of the person alone, that's an important issue. The second things that we look at are falls and fractures. 
And so somebody who's had a fracture that occurred really with minimal trauma um, is on our radar in terms of having osteoporosis. So what do I mean by that? Well, if somebody falls skiing and they say, oh, it was a terrible wipeout, I was going really quickly, caught an edge and fell, or they fall off their bicycle, those are traumatic fractures. And whether you're 22 or 82, those likely would be happening. But a low trauma fracture is one that when you really think about it, you think when I was 30, that would not have happened. So that's when you're walking in our nasty weather today where it's really wet, at least in the Toronto region, you slip and fall, you put your arms out like this and you break a wrist. Or it's the fracture where somebody loses their balance as they're walking towards the bathroom and catches their upper arm on you know, the, the dresser that they go by and you break that upper arm bone or slip and fall with a hip fracture where you really look and think it really was just a normal fall. So these are called low trauma fractures. The definition is a fall from standing height. And so when we look at those, those fractures really suggest that there's a problem with the bone quantity and quality. And so that is a huge issue. Um, and the falls and fractures tend to go together. It's almost never that people have an osteoporosis fracture where there wasn't some slight fall. Maybe the exception would be in the back where we can also get those fractures, coughing and sneezing or lifting something that really didn't seem that heavy can precipitate that. So those are a really big issue. And then the next part of the conversation is really looking at general health issues because we know that very specific diseases and a whole variety of the drugs that we use um, can affect bone, some in a positive way, but more often than not in a negative way. And so, you know, if I give you one example, prednisone is a drug which we know can have a significant impact on some people's bone. So as part of that discussion, your family doctor will look at that fall and fracture issue. They will look at what I call diseases and drugs, and then looking at lifestyle and family history. And family history is very important because we know if somebody comes to see me and their mother or father had a hip fracture, that individual in front of me is five to nine times more likely to have an osteoporosis fracture. So as we're looking at this, we're looking at you as an individual, we're looking at the story that you come with, we're really looking at fractures. And then the last way we can really look at trying to um, assess or diagnose osteoporosis is in the right context, looking at a bone density study. And most of the guidelines now are changing, but fairly frequently it's looking at people over the age of 65 should have a bone density done because by age alone they're at risk. And then in the 50 to 50 or to 64 year old population, if you've got risk factors identified through that conversation, then that's another way. So clinical history is one, falls and fractures is two, bone density would be three. Lisa, that's quite different to the osteoarthritis world. So maybe I'll, I'll toss over to you then. Great, thank you. And, and I don't think I have a slide. So if you wanted to take the slides down, that would be fine. Um, osteoarthritis is, is generally diagnosed by a clinical history. So similar in some ways to osteoporosis, but a good cl clinical history and a physical examination. Um, we don't want to rely on x-ray imaging alone because we know that at the very early stages of osteoarthritis, when people are just starting to experience symptoms, that they don't, won't necessarily have any x-ray changes. And actually, it can take as much as 10 to 15 years from that initial onset of symptoms before we say those, those imaging changes. So it's important that a healthcare professional is doing a, a good clinical history and physical examination and using that to be able to accurately determine whether or not you have osteoarthritis. Imaging can be useful for other things though. The imaging is important, especially if you think that you might be at a stage where you need to speak with a surgeon. So imaging will be able to tell you what degree of severity of arthritis you have and whether or not you need to be considering a, a total knee replacement or a total hip replacement. Uh, and x-rays, of course, can also be used to roll out other conditions if you're concerned that you might have injured yourself and you want to make sure that you didn't break a bone or other things, then imaging can be used for that. Like in osteoporosis, there are many different risk factors and some of the risk factors are, are similar. So uh, aging, certainly we see that there's an increased incidence in both osteoarthritis and osteoporosis with age. It's not that age specifically causes the condition, but it increases the likelihood of it happening, especially in postmenopausal women. 
Um, and like in osteoporosis, uh, women are more likely to develop osteoarthritis. So they're about two times more likely to experience osteoarthritis than men, unfortunately. Other things that can contribute are things like hereditary factors, the, the shape of the joint, and even just lifestyle uh, decisions that people make, how they were raised, um, and some congenital factors as well. So sometimes people are born with congenital abnormalities. Um, a common one is the, the shape of the hip joint. So some people, their, their ball and socket of their hip joint isn't quite right, and either the ball's too big or the the socket is too shallow and so it doesn't quite fit together properly and increases the likelihood that that's going to degenerate at a faster rate than it does for somebody else. Those are all the non-modifiable risk factors, things that we don't necessarily have any, any choice over, any impact over. Um, but there are modifiable risk factors as well and those are the ones that we really try to emphasize. Um, so modifiable risk factors are things such as how much body weight you're carrying, we encourage people to try to maintain a healthy body weight, uh, especially when we're considering the weight bearing joints. So if we're thinking about the hips and the knees, we really have this exaggerated effect on those weight bearing joints. It's about three times your body weight at the hips and about four times your body weight at your knees. So from, from purely from kind of a, a load perspective, we wanna reduce how much force is going through those joints. We also know that muscle strength is a very important feature. Uh, both for cause and effect. So from a, an effect perspective, um, when people have osteoarthritis and if they are in pain, they often are less physically active, they're doing less movement and they might lose muscle mass. And that loss of muscle mass is going to have a negative impact on the progression of that arthritis. Uh, but we see it even working the other way, that if somebody just tends to have a, a sedentary lifestyle, they don't have a great level of fitness and strength, that lack of muscle mass is really supposed to be protective for the joints, that it acts as a primary shock absorber. And if somebody doesn't have that, then it means that they're going to be putting more force through their joints and potentially um, breaking down or deteriorating that cartilage faster than it otherwise would have. Uh, and that goes for even just a general physical level of fitness within your daily life because cartilage doesn't have much of a blood supply. It really relies on absorbing the nutrients from the synovial fluid within the joint. And it does that by movement. It does that by, by dynamically loading that cartilage. And we think of the cartilage like a sponge. So when you're walking, if you are compressing that, that cartilage, it releases toxins. And then when the pressure is taken off, it's able to absorb or kind of suck the synovial fluid and all those nutrients back up into it to keep it healthy. So movement's really important, your level of physical activity. And, and finally, the last feature that we look at, which is kind of modifiable, maybe not 100%, but partially, is, uh, is joint injuries. So as Dr. McDonald Bloomer says, injuries happen, you know, people, people fall, they break bones, they injure their joints, and we can't always have a effect on that. But we also know that when people are physically fit, when they have good muscle tone, when they have good balance, then they're less likely to have quite as many of those falls, which could lead to injuries. Uh, and, and good use of joint protection strategies so that you're not overusing your joints and potentially getting a lot of micro traumas, which can lead to that deterioration of the cartilage. Uh, so lots of different risk factors. It's a complicated topic, much like osteoporosis. There's not one easy answer to, to how you can fix these types of problems. Great. I did have a question for both of you. Um, and it's, can you have both of these conditions at the same time? Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, in fact, there have been some studies looking that if you're likely to get one, you're very likely to get the other. So although, as Lisa was saying, the osteoarthritis is a very cartilage-based process and the osteoporosis is a very bone-based process, um, cartilage and bone are intermarried. And therefore, because of age, because of similar risk factors, we certainly see it in both populations, men and women, um, mostly driven by the fact that as people age, these things seem to be a little bit more prevalent for a variety of different reasons. So yes, yeah, so it's very, I think it's challenging for patients. I think the big piece is when somebody comes in and says to me, oh, I've got pain in my hip, it must be my osteoporosis. 
I know that that's not likely true, that that's much more likely to be a muscular issue or um, you know, referred pain from the back or you know, pain coming from the hip joint itself. There are a number of different features that Lisa and I would go through to try to address that. Um, because generally speaking, in the absence of a fracture, osteoporosis will not cause pain. Lisa, did you have any additions? No, I, I think that uh, that hits it right on the nail that uh, yes, you definitely can have both. Uh, and, and I think that's part of what's confusing for people because they, they then don't know what is causing what symptoms. And so they, they do get a, a little bit uh, concerned that it, it might be the, oste as you said, the osteoporosis is why I have so much back pain or, or a hip pain. And, um, and that can be confusing for them to know then what is the appropriate treatment strategies that they should be using when they aren't 100% sure what it is that's causing the symptoms in the first place. Great, thank you. So let's move on to our third question. And it is, how do you treat each condition? We'll start with Dr. McDonald Bloomer. And then we can move to the next slide that will help keep me organized. So you know, starting at the left-hand side, one of the most important things in terms of treating osteoporosis after you've identified it is looking at lifestyle and how can we modify our lifestyle accordingly. So there are a few pieces that I'm actually going to get Lisa to talk about afterwards because some of the fall prevention strategies, exercise strategies, are really things that as a physiotherapist, she's very expert in. And, and so I'm going to defer to her. But before we get to that, when we look at lifestyle, the other pieces are looking at your diet. So you need some protein in your diet, kind of a fistful of protein every day. That's important for general health, but also for bone health. Calcium and vitamin D are the two pieces that get the probably the most significant conversation. And our calcium suggestions have changed over time. So now we really look at people getting about a thousand, maybe 1200 milligrams of what's called elemental calcium uh, in their sort of their average daily intake. It seems to be preferred if that can be through diet. So if you look at an eight ounce glass of any type of milk, soy, almond, rice milk, regular milk, um, you get between 250 and 300 milligrams of calcium in that eight ounces. And similarly, we can go through all of the different calcium containing foods and get a guesstimate of how much calcium you're getting in. And for those people who are interested, there's a calcium calculator on the Osteoporosis Canada website. It's a fun tool to go to, to take an average diet for the day, and then, you know, maybe two or three versions of your diet and see where your calcium intake is sitting. And if it's in that 1000 to 1200 milligram range, that's perfect. For some people, that's a little bit challenging, either because of preferences or other health considerations. And when that happens, then we start looking at calcium supplements. And again, remembering that if you're looking at calcium carbonate or calcium citrate, that's a combined molecule. So what it says on the package may be a bit confusing. And as an example, you know, calcium carbonate is often 1250 milligrams, but that's a combination. In the smaller print, it'll say elemental calcium, 500 milligrams. So we look at having people take calcium supplements as needed um, and trying to space them out across the day. It's kind of like a sponge. If you, you know, spill on the counter, you may have to do two or three wipes to get it up. Similarly, the body's absorption of calcium is much more effective if it gets a little bit breakfast, lunch, and dinner time. So for people on supplements, we try to spread that out. So that's important. The other things that we look at are modifying caffeine intake. The data is not good for that, but we know people who drink a lot of coffee or caffeinated beverage may have less uh, bone density. Alcohol needs to be done in moderation. The old guidelines say, you know, 10 drinks or less for women and probably 12 for men, but the new Canada guidelines are much less than that. And so I think we're probably going to look at re reviewing that as well. So that becomes important. No physician, no healthcare practitioner likes tobacco for any way, shape or form, but we know that avoiding tobacco is also healthy from a bone perspective. So these are all the very foundational pieces. And when those are being used, we use that for prevention. So people who don't yet have osteoporosis, but may be at risk because of family history or other health issues. 
And then for that group that fall into the osteoporosis category, so have either had a fracture, they've got low bone density on their bone density testing and are considered to be high risk, then we start considering the benefits of pharmacotherapy. And the little slide here, you can see just at the top. So we've got lots of therapies, alendronate, zolendronate, resedronate. So just for people who use the other names, that would be Fosamax and Aclasta and Actinel. Hormone therapies in some people, parathyroid hormone, which is Forteo or teriparatide, and denosumab, which is prolia. So we've got these different treatment options available. And with your healthcare practitioner, the first is, do you need one? And then the secondly is which drug is going to work best for your particular condition. And that's really beyond our discussion today. But I think the piece I want people to think about is we've actually changed our approach. So when I started doing osteoporosis work a very long time ago, we were thinking of lifelong therapies. Whereas now we know that we could get really good effect from our drugs for the most part for three to six years of use for the top drugs, so what we call the bisphosphonates, alendronate and zolendronate and resedronate, but you don't need to take them forever. And it's important to look at that because we also know the longer you're on these medications, the higher the risk of some of the adverse events. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Similarly with hormone therapy, if people are using that, our gynecology colleagues say, you know, probably stop that by age 55 to 60. Uh, again, because side effect risks go up with time. Parathyroid hormone or Forteo is only used for two years uh, in our current frame of reference for a whole variety of reasons. And then we flip over to something else. And I guess the outlier is denosumab. And so for people on denosumab or prolia, we've got data out to 10 years. It's a very long discussion with your healthcare provider. But the important message with that one is don't stop it without having medical advice because you'll lose all the benefits from the drug and that can have fairly significant consequences. So the one piece I just before my part concludes that I just wanted to look at is this change in strategy, this looking at three to six years of treatment as being the ideal or for people who've been on these other drugs for longer stopping and having a drug holiday or interrupting is really trying to hit the balance between optimizing our bone strength, which helps decrease fractures and minimizing the risk of adverse events. And one of the side effects or adverse events that you may have heard about is something called an atypical femoral fracture. And so you know, I probably should have put up a slide, but if you look at this, if this is what your hip is sort of shaped like, here's the ball and socket joint. This is the part you stand on. Most hip fractures related to osteoporosis occur at the neck of the hip, which is here. But we have found that a very small but meaningful percentage of people who've been on long-term osteoporosis therapy get fractures down here. So it's in the main part of the leg bone. And it probably relates to the fact that we're interrupting the bone's normal repair mechanism. This almost never happens when people have been on these drugs for shorter periods of time and seems to increase when people have been on the drugs for lengthy periods of time. So again, for those people who've been on these drugs for long periods of time, it's an excellent discussion point to have with your healthcare provider. How do you stop? How long do you stop? We know that if you're off these drugs for one to two years, all of those negative things seem to reverse. So you know, it, it is a complicated discussion, but I think the pieces that I want people to walk away with, one, we have treatment for when treatment is needed. Two, we're very selective about waiting to use treatment when people reach a high enough risk to really get good bang for your buck with the treatment. And for all of our drugs, we're really looking at a balance between how long to use them, recognizing that each individual drug is slightly different. So again, it's a good discussion point with your healthcare providers. So that's kind of an overview of the treatment pieces for osteoporosis. And now Lisa's going to give us an overview of the osteoarthritis treatment, which has some commonalities, but the drug issues are very different. Thank you. Uh, and we're going to focus on, uh, on exercises and how that relates to the osteoporosis and osteoarthritis. Uh, and there's a lot of similarities in between what the recommendations are for both of these conditions. Uh, in osteoporosis, the, the medications uh, definitely play a vital role, especially for somebody who has a high risk fracture. But we also really need people to be doing exercise for, for many different reasons. The exercise itself can't build new bone, so you can't improve your bone density scan strictly through exercise, but we know that exercise 
is really important when it comes to maintaining your density, um, improving your strength and improving your balance, which is gonna improve your fall risk, which is when we see most of those fractures happening. For osteoporosis, we generally encourage weight-bearing exercises as this seems to produce the best result. And weight-bearing exercise really means any type of aerobic activity done up on your feet uh, with your bones supporting your weight. The exercise recommendations just for the general population are 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous uh, physical activity a week. The, the one change to that in osteoporosis is if you have an existing uh, compression fracture in your spine or a history of that, then we just, we drop the vigorous part and we encourage people just to stick with, stick with the moderate uh, physical activity. Uh, so this could relate to going for a nice brisk walk, uh, a 20 to 30 minute brisk walk, something that gets your heart rate up a little bit. If you're able to do that most days of the week, then you're achieving your 150 minutes a week that you are, are recommended to have. Um, other types of aerobic activity are weight bearing exercises as well. So, you know, I mentioned walking, but things like dancing, um, elliptical machines, uh, uh, low impact aerobics, step classes, those would all count towards it as well. So you can find the one that works for you. We also know that it's really important to be doing strengthening. So the, again, the general population, we're recommending strengthening two to three times a week. But then in osteoporosis, we specifically have this recommendation that you are doing uh, specific postural strengthening, postural exercises and balance exercises really on a daily basis. Uh, and that's because we know that with osteoporosis, especially if people have compression fractures, there's this tendency for people to get into a, a forward slouched posture. And so we really wanna strengthen the muscles in our back to help us be upright and have a, a good tall posture and not be slumping forward. Um, the balance exercises, that might be specific exercises that you do at home, or it can be part of, of an existing program that you have. Uh, there's some great different options out there. Tai Chi is wonderful for balance. Uh, yoga can be very good for balance. It might require a few modifications to it. Uh, walking, even just on uneven surfaces. So if you were going for a hike and you were work, walking on uneven ground, all those things are going to challenge your balance and they're good to be doing on a regular basis. Um, so that's for the osteoporosis. There are four things that I encourage people just to be careful of, and maybe we can go to the next slide. So four things that I just encourage people to be cautious about. The first is, is activities that require you to be doing a lot of forceful or repetitive forward bending of the spine. So that forward bending of the spine is going to be a risk, especially if you have a history of compression fractures or quite low density through the spine. We don't want to do something that's going to put a lot of pressure and potentially cause a compression fracture. And that would be the same with doing really forceful or repetitive twisting. So rotation through the spine can also be a higher risk activity. And finally, heavy lifting, uh, especially from the floor. So if you're, if you're bent forward into that slouched posture and then you're picking up something heavy or sometimes not even that heavy off the floor, those are often a, a much higher risk activity that could lead to having a fracture. So we wanna be careful about those things for sure. And if you are doing something like yoga or Pilates, you can still do those, but you might need to talk to a healthcare professional about just modifying some of the movements to avoid that forceful rotation or a forceful flexion to the spine. And that can certainly be done for lots of different activities. Um, other activities that might be a higher risk as well, we think of things like downhill skiing, horseback riding, um, <laughs> contact sports, you know, anything that's gonna put you in a situation where you might be then falling from a height or with great velocity or being slammed into the boards in hockey, those obviously are gonna pose a, a, hard, a larger risk and it needs to be a conversation with a health professional as to whether or not it's safe for you to do or whether or not there's ways that you can make it safer for you. For osteoarthritis, and we can take this slide down now, thank you. Uh, for osteoarthritis, so those guidelines are really going to be pretty much the same as what you just saw. You're going to have your 150 minutes a week of aerobic activity. You're going to have your strengthening and you're going to have your stretching two to three times a week. 
The difference is that in osteoarthritis, you might have limitations because of joint pain or, or a loss of range of motion, uh, in which case you're gonna have to change the type of activity that you do. Whereas we really want people to do a weight bearing exercise in osteoporosis and osteoarthritis, that might not be comfortable. You might not be able to do 20 to 30 minutes of walking because of pain in your, in your knees or your hips or your back. Uh, so you might need to consider less weight bearing activities that might be going into the water where the buoyancy of the water really takes some of that, where the load off of your joints, the impact off of your joints, or, or even just a partial weight bearing, like using a stationary bike or a recumbent bike, where you're still getting range of motion, you're still getting strengthening, uh, but it's not in a full weight bearing position. So you take some of the strain off of those joints. We know that strength is gonna be really important for both of these conditions. We really wanna have that good strength that's vital for osteoarthritis in particular. We need those muscles because they're our primary shock absorbers. And without that good muscle strength, people generally do experience more pain and more functional loss. Unfortunately, as we age, we lose about 10% of our muscle between the ages of 20, uh, 25 to 50. And then we lose another 45% more in between the ages of 50 and 80. But the good news is that we can actually build muscle mass at any age in response to exercise. So it's never too late to start exercising. For both conditions, good strength, it's gonna reduce your risk of injury, it's gonna protect your joints, uh, and hopefully it also leads to a reduction in some of your symptoms. It just might be that you might need to work with a healthcare professional just to have the appropriate modifications and ensure that you're doing that activity in a safe and comfortable way so that you can do it on a consistent basis and keep up with those good lifestyle changes that we need. And that's it for me for the, the lifestyle portion. That's great. Thank you, Lisa and Heather. Um, lots of great questions answered by both of you. Um, so now we're going to move on to our question and answer session. Um, thanks again so much. Lots of great information to think about. We're going to try to answer as many questions as we can in, in the time remaining. Um, so we'll just go back and forth between Heather and Lisa with the questions and everyone chime in as to with an answer. So our first question we'll start with is, what is the difference between osteopenia and osteoarthritis? Oh, now that one's a bit sir, challenging. So let me take the first stab at that. So osteopenia is the gray zone between when bone density and bone quality is perfectly normal as we might see in a healthy 20 year old. And as it is transitioning towards the stage that we saw in that first slide, where you've got thinning of the bone. And so you've got changes in the quantity and quality. And the term osteopenia was used for initially that we would talk about normal bone density, we would talk about osteopenia and then osteoporosis. We're trying to replace that term now because it is confusing for people to look at. And so if we're looking now, we often will talk about that in-between area as being low bone mass or low bone density. And the way that we usually figure out is somebody in the low bone density category or the osteoporosis category is through their bone density assessment. And so when you get your bone density assessed, and I'm going to make the assumption that the vast majority of people listening are age 50 or above. But when we're looking at that, one of the, the metrics that your healthcare provider will see will be what are called T-scores. And these are scores that look at what your bone density is relative to a healthy 25 or 30 year old female or male, depending on your sex. And we use some other metrics as well. So they are also looking at you know, the, your ethnicity, your height and your weight, but we can take your particular bone density and put it into categories. And so if the T-score, this sort of metric, um, is between plus one and minus one on our scale, that would be considered normal. If your bone density is minus 2.5 or lower, then that's considered osteoporosis. And then that middle ground of minus 1.1 to minus 2.4 for the T-score would be this low bone density or the old osteopenia term. And so really when we're looking at that is to say it's the transition point 
Um, some people never get to the osteoporosis stage, other people do, but that's the difference. So it really doesn't have a lot of impact in terms of osteoarthritis. This is really very specific to the osteoporosis world and is this theoretical construct that we look at where we can see where your bone density is on the bone density or DEXA assessment. Yeah, I think that's a, a great explanation of it. And, and what I usually tell my patients on, on a much more um, basic level is that I, I explain that it means that they have less bone density, that it's not causing the symptoms. Because often when they're seeing me, they're seeing me for their arthritis. And so I usually just assure them that the, the symptoms that they're having, whether it's knee pain or back pain or whatever it might be, I say that that is due to your osteoarthritis. The osteopenia means that they did a test on you, a bone scan, and that it showed that your bones weren't quite as dense as they used to be, That they and that that means that in the future, there could be a risk of breaking a bone more easily, but that it's not something that you feel. It's not something that's causing you symptoms. Right. I think the only other time that I would see the term osteopenia, if people are looking at their x-ray results online, if people have not so much osteoarthritis, but if they have one of the more inflammatory types of joint disease, rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, we know that the inflammation of the joint also takes away a little bit of the bone around the joint. So if people are reading their x-ray results, um, they may see the term periarticular, so around the joint, osteopenia, and that's the radiologist way of saying to us that it looks like there's some inflammation and it's washing the bone out a little bit, but that's quite different from how we use it in the osteoporosis world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, thank you. Our next question is, when should you start bone density testing? And is bone density testing bad for you? Okay, so the current, sort of guidelines are a little bit different depending on where you live and which guidelines. But as a general rule, men or women age 65 and above should probably have bone density testing done at least one to once to figure out where they are. And if the bone density comes back and is normal, then repeating it probably isn't necessary unless there's a change in general health. And that's a, a broad topic. For people between the ages of 50 and 64, the current guideline, um, and again, I'm looking at sort of international guidelines, that if you've had a fracture, that's one of these low trauma fractures, getting your bone density assessed is part of a sort of a process to try to understand, would you be a good candidate for therapy? If you have other risk factors, family history of osteoporosis, your mom had a hip fracture, or you've had you know, an arthritis condition like rheumatoid arthritis, or you've been on some of the medications that we know are a little bit notorious for changing bone. So going back to that discussion where we're looking at risk factors, if you have two risk factors or more and you're in that age, 50 to, to 64 year old age group, it's generally thought that it's wise to get a bone density done so that you can make further treatment decisions accordingly. And then I guess the last group is there are some people who've been healthy, but then they end up with having something pretty dramatic, breast cancer, prostate cancer, um, some of these diseases that require high dose prednisone. And often as a part of the initial workup, people will be asked to have a bone density because we know that the drugs used for some of those, those uh, different types of diseases are really challenging from a bone perspective. So again, that conversation is really important to, to look at having. So that was part A. Part B is, you know, a bone density test is an x-ray, but you get about the same amount of radiation from that as you would get flying from here to Vancouver. And I don't think any of us really think about getting on a plane and, you know, being worried about the, the radiation exposure. And so we really don't worry about it with the exception that I don't think anybody would do a bone density test intentionally on a woman who is pregnant. But when we look at where we're doing it mostly, it's really inconsequential and very different from what we would be advising with back x-rays um, or CT scans or things like that, which have much higher radiation amounts. So, Dr. McDonald Bloomer, um, if somebody had a, a bone density scan done at say at age 65 and it showed some low bone density, do you recommend that they have a repeat done every certain number of years? It depends on what we're going to do about that. So if they fall into the low bone density category, it's always nice to see what the time frame is. So doing one a year later is actually really helpful 
for decision making because if it's the same in 2020 as it was in 2022, um, then it gives you a different idea of how to help manage their bone health. Whereas if you see that it was here in 2020 and it's there in 2022, it gives us a, a different thought process. So I think generally speaking, if we can do one one or two years later, that's very valuable. I think where we're seeing changes is that if we're choosing treatment and people are on stable treatment for three to six years, we're probably actually doing too many bone density tests and we may not need to do them quite as frequently. The other one that I always struggle with is when people choose not to look at drug therapy, they're comfortable with lifestyle. Um, I'm not sure what the value of repeating the bone density test is. And we certainly see people who, for whatever reasons, are, are more comfortable in not adding in what I would call pharmacotherapy. And repeated bone densities probably are not as helpful in that group because we're not using it to inform our treatment strategies down the road. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Um, our next question is, are osteoporosis and osteoarthritis reversible or just manageable? <laughs> I wish. Lisa, why don't you take that one? I've been doing all the talking. <laughs> so unfortunately, not reversible. Uh, so uh, we, we have not developed a way to regrow cartilage. And if we ever do, then that will certainly be a game changer in the world of osteoarthritis. Um, so although we can't reverse the, the damage, what we do know is that often things like weight loss, um, physical activity, strengthening exercises can reduce the symptoms. So it really comes down to symptom management. And the medication that is out there for osteoarthritis is all intended for symptom management. It is not disease modifying, which means that um, if we take things like Tylenol or anti-inflammatories uh, such as Celebrex or Meloxicam, those are used just to help us um, cope with our symptoms of arthritis. They're not going to actually change the progression of the disease. That's going to be related to a variety of things, some of it just purely genetics that we don't always have control over it. Uh, but we optimize the lifestyle component of it as much as we can to try to affect the progression, knowing that we can't undo damage once it has been done. And I think in the osteoporosis realm, our, our goal is not to normalize the bone density. Um, when you go back two or three decades, that was the goal, but we now know that when people have chosen to take pharmacotherapy, so any of the drugs that we talk about, that there will be an increase in the bone density that happens in the vast majority of individuals, some drugs more so than others, and that it will then plateau. So if we look at our common medications, we'll see increases for three to five years, and then the bone density will stabilize. It may not be in the normal range, but even with that, we know that the anti-fracture benefit is about a 50% reduction in terms of back fractures and about a 40% reduction in terms of the non-back fractures, so things like wrist and hip fractures. So even though the T-score that we were talking about may not get to the normal range, the data tells us that the medications are, are helpful. The exception probably is some of our bone building drugs. So a few people will be placed on drugs like romosuzumab, which is the other name is Avenity, or on teriparatide, the other name for that is Forteo. And those drugs actually help us build bone when we use them for short periods of time, one to two years. And for a small number of people, again, we'll see the bone density really go up. It may get into the normal range, but that's not our goal and it's not our expectation. Because again, our clinical trials tell us that using the drug consistently and as prescribed, we still see anti-fracture benefit, even if the bone density doesn't go up. So we don't expect to normalize it, but we do know that um, the converse, if the bone density is going down, we have to think about our management process. Right. Thank you. Lots of great questions coming in, and I'm, I'm hoping we can get to as many as we can. Um, someone is asking, how should I prepare to talk to my doctor about osteoporosis slash osteoarthritis? And um, what questions should I be asking? 
That's a challenging question because the dialogues are a little bit different. So I think we probably, and Lisa, correct me, but I think first of all, looking at your own personal risk factors. And so really looking at, for the osteoporosis one, because it's not a symptom-based issue. By the way, my mom had a hip fracture when she was 80. My sister's been told she has low bone density. My you know, brother has such and such. I'm concerned, where do I go? Is probably a good introduction. Or I'm 65 years old next year. What should I be thinking about if that's you know, not been part of the, the discussion up to then? I think that's often a good starting point. Whereas in the osteoarthritis sphere, I think most people are symptom driven. Would you agree, Lisa? Yeah, I think that generally people, they go to their doctor with a specific complaint. They're going because they have pain, they've noticed a, a change in the shape of their joint or a loss of range of motion. Yeah, in, in uh, osteoarthritis, I think being able to speak with your, your doctor and express kind of specifically what your concerns are, because there is a, a big difference in between a concern of whether you've just noticed a, a change in the shape of your joint and you want to confirm what is happening versus somebody who is not able to go for an evening walk after dinner anymore because they can't go for more than 10 minutes. Um, you need to be able to express kind of what your concerns are and also what you're hoping to to get as far as treatment? Is it that you're looking for a referral for physiotherapy or is it that you're really struggling with pain and you wanna talk about what type of pharmacological management there might be for that condition? Um, I don't think that we have to go to the doctor simply to get an X-ray to confirm the presence of osteoarthritis as we talked about. Uh, but as I said, you know, taking a proper clinical history, a physical examination, often the physician can just using those techniques and, and looking at your joint is able to say, yes, that seems consistent with osteoarthritis. I'm not concerned that we're dealing with something more concerning. Um, and, you know, these are, are kind of your treatment options. Are you needing medication for symptoms or would you like to try physiotherapy to try to help build up the bone in that area? Um, those would be the types of things that you want to kind of have a bit of a, a mindset going into it of, of what your concerns are and what you want to be getting out of that appointment. I think my one plea for patients is that our healthcare system, as I suspect everybody knows, is sometimes disconnected. So if you've had a fracture, if you go to the emergency department because you broke your arm or something like that, I think that to me is the most important conversation to take back to your healthcare practitioner because sometimes those notes don't effectively go from our emergency department back to the family physician. And if you've had a low trauma fracture, as we were discussing before, it's, I think, mandatory. Now, recognize I'm biased, but I think it's mandatory to have a discussion with somebody about what are the next steps? Why did it happen? What can we do to prevent more? So for people who've had one of those fractures, that to me is the perfect intro. Dear Dr. So-and-so, broke my arm two weeks ago, back on my feet right now, should I come into the office? The answer should be yes. Yeah, and I think it, I do think that that's um, a, an area where maybe we're not excellent at, at providing that follow-up care, that things are getting, slipping through the cracks. And um, I often have patients tell me they are like, oh, well, you know, I broke it because, oh yeah, I, well, I fell really hard. But as we said, you shouldn't break a bone from standing height. So even if it feels traumatic to you, if you just are falling from standing height without a lot of velocity being falling from a height, those, those things they need to be looked into and, uh, and you should be following up with your doctor. I agree with that discussion of why did I break that bone when it was a fall from just a standing height. Okay. We are running out of time, so we will be getting down to the last couple of questions. Um, we'll, we'll go with this question. How do you do weight bearing exercises for osteoporosis if you're having a flare up affecting your feet? Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, it's definitely, that's the, the double-edged sword right there is that we recommend the weight bearing for osteoporosis. And often if you have the osteoarthritis, that might not be possible. And I, I think that an important thing to consider is that although we recommend um, weight bearing exercises, it 
it's still good to do any form of activity. So being physically active, even if that means that you're doing it not in a weight bearing capacity, if you're using a bike, if you're sitting and doing strengthening exercises, using resistance bands or weights, uh, if you're in, even if you're in the water, you know, all those things, although they're not technically a weight bearing exercise, they are still gonna provide you with many benefits, including strengthening of the muscles, uh, challenging your cardiovascular system, challenging your balance system. Uh, I think that it's better to do what works for you and your symptoms during that period of time and acknowledging that there, there's always going to be a benefit from that, even if you can't specifically do a full weight bearing activity. Uh, so don't, don't feel bad about not being able to go for a walk. Instead, look at things that you can comfortably do without making that flare up in your feet a lot worse. And that's where I wish, Lisa, that our patients had much more access to our physiotherapists because you know, I, I think family doctors sometimes are aware but may not have the time. Um, I, I think there's so many gaps. And if I could advocate, you know, the Arthritis Society is a fabulous resource that I wish that all patients will take advantage of some of the online pieces, but that hands-on piece that you've just described is just so helpful but I do encourage people because there's lots of stuff on the arthritis society website that can be very helpful to give people those suggestions isn't that right yeah there, there's definitely online stuff and and within Ontario we have the arthritis rehabilitation education program which in Ontario means that you can access as a free service uh, a free service speaking with physiotherapists and occupational therapists so it's it's out there to to people with arthritis to be able to contact and often people do have osteoarthritis and osteoporosis or the inflammatory conditions as well okay i think we're going to wrap things up here thank you both for an informative presentation on osteoporosis and osteoarthritis. And thank you to our partner, the Arthritis Society of Canada. For more information on, on arthritis, please visit arthritis.ca. And for more information on osteoporosis, please visit our website at osteoporosis.ca. Again, thank you so much to Lisa and Heather for their wonderful information. Um, you'll find many, many tools, including um, calcium calculators, more podcasts, quizzes, and a repository of past webinars on our website. And thanks to all of you for joining us today, and have a great day. Thanks again.